Okay, so up to now we've derived the Lorentz transformations from a blank page using only the special principle of relativity. Uh, so that's the two postulates that speed of light is constant in all inertial reference frames, uh, the same in all inertial reference frames, and that the laws of physics apply equally in all inertial reference frames. Okay, and remember this, um, these postulates came from Einstein thinking about Maxwell's work in which he unified electricity and magnetism and showed that the speed of light should be constant in all inertial reference frames, contradicting Newton. Um, so now we're going to think about the profound consequences of the Lorentz transformations. Um, let's first think about um, a situation in which uh, we're thinking about the velocities of an object as observed by different uh, reference frames or observers in different frames. Okay, so let's think about two frames, S and S bar. And let's have someone called Mo in S and someone called Joe in S bar. Okay, let's think about some particle moving through space, okay, with some velocity. And to Mo, who lives in frame S, the particle has velocity V, P. To Joe, the particle has velocity, so let's see, Mo, particle has velocity VP, and to Joe, the particle has velocity VP bar. Okay, and the question is, how are these guys related? So it's not the case that VP bar equals VP minus U. Okay, it's not the case in special relativity. So this is our Galilean. If this was an equal sign, this would be the Galilean transformation. So a particle moving with velocity v. If you're in this frame moving away with velocity u, then you'll see it with a velocity reduced by u. So it's not the case. So how are vp bar and vp related? Okay, well, we can easily derive this uh, from the Lorentz transformations. So let's write them down. We've got x bar equals gamma. Uh, x minus ut, and we've got t bar equals gamma t minus uh, u uh, x over c squared. <clears throat> so let's think about v x bar, which is dx bar by dt bar. Okay, so we know from the Lorentz transformation that x bar is gamma x minus ut. And gamma depends on a velocity, but the velocity it depends on is u. And this is constant in time. Okay, so gamma is independent um, of any time. So we can write this as gamma. And we know that dx bar is dx minus u dt. And we know that dt bar is gamma dt minus u dx over c squared. Okay, and if we divide through, so the gammas cancel. If we divide through by dt on board, we see this equals uh, dx by dt minus u over one minus u over c squared dx by dt. And this is just vx minus u over 1 minus u over c squared uh, vx. So we find that vx bar is equal to not just vx minus u, but a vx minus u divided by this thing. Okay, so this is the uh, transformation of velocities in special relativity. Now our frame is moving along the x direction. So this is how our vx transforms. It turns out that our vy and vz transform a bit differently. So with that we have the vy bar, which is dy bar by dt bar. But here y bar is just y. So vy bar 
is dy by dt bar. And we know that dt bar is equal to gamma dt minus u dx over c squared. Okay, and if we divide through by dt, this gives us a dy by dt, which is just vy over gamma, and then we've got a one minus u over c squared. We have a dx by dt, which is vx. Okay, and we find a similar result for vz. It's equal to vz over gamma one minus u over c squared vx. Okay, so you'll see that um, for the y and the z, we'll get a y on the top, a y, a z on the top, but the x appears in the bottom. Okay, and this x represents the fact that the two frames are moving away from each other in along the x direction. Okay, so, so the transformations of velocity are such that, of course, they are consistent with the uh, postulates of special relativity. Um, and in particular, that the speed of light is consistent and the same as measured by all inertial observers. Okay, so the speed of light is constant, the same value is measured by all observers in inertial reference frames. And uh, we can see that this emerges if we consider the quantity c squared minus v bar squared. Okay, where C is the speed of light and V bar is Vx bar squared plus Vy bar squared plus Vz bar squared. And if we write this in terms of the Vx, the Vy and the Vz, and our other velocity u, which tells us how fast the frame S bar moves away from S, then we'll see that out of the three velocities, so we've got three velocities, we've got a V, a U bar, and a v bar. Out of so, if, if two out of three of those take their maximum value, and rem remember we have a speed limit; it's the speed of light c. So, out of the three velocities, um, v bar, v, and u. If two out of three, and we're like thinking about the magnitudes of these things, if two out of three equals c, the speed of light, then we find that the other one must be the speed of light also. Okay, um, so if, if v and u are both c, then we find v bar equals c. If v bar and v equals c, then u bar will be c, etc. So this is just a restatement of the first postulate of special relativity. Um, and this is really kind of non-intuitive. We also find that if any two velocities are less than c, then the third will be less than c. Okay, so we can't we can't go faster than the speed of light by being in a frame that moves fast. Okay, so what we're saying is that if we have some frame s, okay, and put yourself at the coordinate origin of frame S and give yourself a torch and shine a torch. Then you measure the speed of light to be C. Okay, simple. But then I'm in a different frame S bar. Okay, so I'm on a bus going down Botanic Avenue okay, or somewhere closer to home. And this is frame S bar. And my bus is very fast, it moves at the speed of light C. Okay, so this is the, the light from your torch. And this C is the velocity that my bus moves at along the x direction um, of frame S, your frame. So what we see is that Although you measure the speed of light to be c, and I'm moving away from you with velocity c, or speed c, 
I still measure the speed of that light to be C. Okay, so this is definitely not the case of the Galilean transformation in which this VP equals. So we have an equals here in the Galilean case. So this is Galilean when it's equal. But our relativistic case is definitely not that. So we have a not equals here. Okay, so we don't really come across, or we haven't really um, had much experience with this in our everyday interactions with um, the world because we move at such low velocities. So when you say that u over c goes to zero, then this term just goes to one, so you've lost the denominator, and you get back the Galilean transformation. Okay, so if you're going slowly, which we tend to do, then you see physics according to Galilean transformations. Okay, but we find the true transformation. It's not the Galilean, it's this one. Okay, so that's velocity transformations. It's non-intuitive. And thinking about a light ray and different frames moving at different speeds um, shows the non-intuitive nature. Okay, but of course we should expect this because the postulate that we started from, that we derived the Lorentz transformations from, from which we wrote down the velocity transformations, um, asserted that the speed of light was constant in all inertial reference frames. Okay, so this is just telling us that the results we've got are consistent and sensible. So from one non-intuitive thing to the next, um, so next we're going to think about the nature of time and specifically how the Lorentz transformations give us um, a profound change in our understanding of time. And specifically, we'll see that we have to abandon the notion of absolute time. Okay, so that's next. So now we're getting to the interesting parts and specifically, we're going to think about time and the nature of time. And we're gonna see that time is not something that's governed by some master clock in the universe that just ticks like a metronome, tick, tock, tick, tock. But the time itself is a relative thing. Okay. Um, so let's think about our Lorentz transformations. Um, we have that x bar, okay, the coordinate in some um, frame s bar that's moving away from frame s with some velocity u in the x direction of s is equal to gamma x minus u uh, t and we have that t bar is equal to gamma t minus u x over c squared. Okay, these are our two Lorentz transformations. And let's consider two events um, that are observed by Mo sitting in frame S. And the first event happens at time t and at coordinates x1, y1, and z1. And the second event happens at the same time t, but at a different place, x2, y2, z2. Okay, so this is event one and event two. Okay, so your Mo setting in frame S and you see two things happen at the same time but in different locations. If your friend is Joe setting in S bar that's moving with some uniform velocity away from your frame S, then what do you perceive? What do you observe? Okay, so the question is, what does Joe observe for these events? So we know from our Lorentz transformation for time that T2 bar equals gamma T, okay, because the events happen in frame S at the same time. So we don't need an index here, it's just t minus u x2 over c squared. 
and the T1 bar equals gamma T minus U X1 over C squared. Okay, so let's think about what Joe observes. He thinks that the two events, one and two, happen with a time difference of T2 bar minus T1 bar. And this equals T2 bar minus T1 bar. It's gamma T minus T, T minus T, minus U X2 over C squared. And then there's um, a minus minus, so plus U X1 over C squared. And this just equals, so the T's cancel, and you've got a gamma U over C squared x2 minus x1. Okay, so this says that uh, the difference in time of the two events, let's call it delta t bar, is not zero as Mo observes, but it's gamma u over c squared delta x, okay, where uh, delta x is x2 minus x1, and delta t bar is t2 bar minus t1 bar. Okay, so what is this telling us? It's telling us something extremely profound, that two events that happen simultaneously in frame S, so Mo experiences two events to happen at the same time but in different locations. If they are in different locations, so if delta x is not zero, then an observer in a different inertial reference frame, Joe, doesn't see these events as simultaneous, okay? They happen at two different times. Okay, so this is very strange, or it should be very strange to you. Um, we've lost the notion of absolute time. Okay, so let's think about an example. Let's bring this to life. So let's think about um, a train and a platform. Okay, you can't do relativity without thinking about um, moving trains and platforms. Okay, and they, they appear in Einstein's original works and have perpetuated. So let's think about Mo, who's in frame S, and he's on the platform waiting for a train. Okay, so this is Mo. Here he is on the platform. This is free MS. And let's think about a different inertial reference free MS bar. And that will be a train going by that has Joe sitting in it. So here is the train carriage that has Joe sitting in it. Okay, and let me draw the train engine. Okay, so here's our train, and there's some kind of carriage that's being trailed behind with Joe on it. And what happens is a bolt of lightning strikes the front and back of the carriage at the same time, according to Mo. So we have a bolt of lightning striking the back of the carriage, and a bolt of lightning striking the front of the carriage. At the same time, according to Mo. So event one here, in Mo's reference frame, S, okay, stationary on the platform. Event one is the bolt of lightning hits the back of the carriage. Okay, so at time T, and at position X1, Y1, Z1, that's this point. Okay, um, and event two, the bolt of lightning strikes the front of the carriage at time t, the same time, according to Mo, but at a different location, x2, y2, z2. Okay, and I've chosen it such that Mo is equidistant from the front and back of the carriage at time t. Okay, so the bolt of lightning strikes, Mo observes it at the same time t. 
But we've just seen that in Joe's frame, which is an inertial reference frame moving away from Mo's frame with velocity u, that these two events that are simultaneous to Mo but occur at different places happen to, they occur at different places to Mo. So this delta x is Mo's delta x, okay? It's x2 minus x1. Then Joe, who's on the moving carriage, says that these events, the lightning bolts striking the front and back of the train, don't happen at the same time. They happen at gamma u over c squared times delta x, where delta x is the um, length of the carriage. Okay. So, how do you understand that? Um, well, if you're Mo, the bolt of lightning hits the front and back of the carriage at the same time. You're equidistant from it. Light travels at the speed of light. So, because you're equidistant, the time it takes the light to travel from the front and the back is the same, and you observe these and think they're simultaneous. Okay, not just you think they're simultaneous, they, they are simultaneous as observed by you when you're Mo. But from Joe's perspective, Joe says that I am equidistant from the back and front of the carriage, and the speed of light is C in my frame, And because Joe is moving, the bolt of lightning that hits the front of the carriage will be observed by Joe first. And the one at the back has to catch up with Joe. So Joe will say the bolt of lightning hit the front first and this one came afterwards. So this is a, a case of the relativi relativity of simultaneity. So now we've seen the shattering consequences that the simultaneity of, of events is um, subjective, so it depends on the observer, depends on the, the reference frame you're in. Um, we can maybe worry about what this means in terms of um, cause and effect or causality. So can you choose a frame such that if the two events are your grandfather being born and you being born, is there a frame in which the order of those events can suddenly be different? Can you be born before your grandfather? Okay, so this is a question of causality. And thankfully, everything works out as we would hope. And we can think about this just in terms of the Lorentz transformations. So let's think about an event P that happens at time t1 and x1. Okay, so let's forget about y and z. Just think about one spatial dimension. An event happens at t1 and x1 that causes an event q at t2 and x2, and this is frame S, so this is um, Mo setting in frame S. Okay, so maybe the event is Mo sits at this point and shines a torch, and once the torch hits something, this is event Q. Okay, so let's say that a signal is sent from P, and when it reaches Q, then we have the second event. And the signal travels at velocity V. So we have that X2 minus X1 equals V T2 minus T1. Okay, and this is the signal speed. Okay, and we have that here uh, x2 is greater than x1 and t2 is greater than t1. Okay, so the event q happens um, after event p. Okay, so this is all in frame s.
So let's now think about a different frame, frame S bar. And can it be chosen such that the order in time of events P and Q are swapped? Okay, let's hope not because we've said that P happens and causes Q. Okay, we send a signal from P and when the signal's received, Q happens. Okay, so we better hope that that order is um, maintained. So let's think about a second frame S bar. Okay, and this is where Joe sits. And Joe measures the time interval between these two events, P and Q, as T2 bar minus T1 bar. Okay, and we know from our Lorentz transformations that this is gamma. Um, T2 bar is uh, T2 minus U X2 over C squared. And minus T1 bar is T1 minus U X1 over C squared. Okay, so this equals gamma T2 minus T1 minus U over C squared X2 minus X1. Okay, but we've said that we're sending a signal with velocity V. So we know that the distance equals the speed of the signal times the time. So we know what x2 minus x1 is in terms of t2 and t1. So let's just put that in. Uh, let's say this is gamma t2 minus t1 minus u over c squared. And then x2 minus x1 is v times t2 minus t1. Okay, so we find that the interval according to Joe in this frame S bar is equal to gamma uh, T2 minus T1 1 minus U V over C squared Okay, so if, if T2 is greater than T1, then T2 bar will be greater than T1 bar, so this thing will be positive. If and only if this thing in the round bracket is greater than zero. So this is greater than zero, gamma is greater than zero, always. Then the question is, is this greater than zero or less than zero? Does event Q happen before P or after? And we maintain our causality that event Q happens after event P if and only if this thing in the round bracket is greater than zero. So we find that T2 bar minus T1 bar, um, or the T2 happens after T1 bar if 1 minus uv over c squared is greater than 0. Okay, and this will be true if v is less than c. Okay, so again we see this speed limit come into play, that we can't send a signal faster than the speed of light. If we did, then the event that caused Q would actually happen after the event Q happened, okay? Which is a kind of mind boggling thing to consider. Okay, so this is um, causality, and this is a statement that um, causality is preserved from different frames. So if an event Q happens after event P in one frame, it also happens after event P in a different frame. Thankfully. So let's continue down the rabbit hole and um, look at another example of how time is subjective. So let's think about two events as observed by Joe 
in frame S bar. And these happen at times T1 bar and locations X bar, Y bar, Z bar. So this is the first event. And the second event happens at a different time, T2 bar, but at the same location, X bar, Y bar, Z bar. Okay, so two events uh, as observed by Joe in frame S bar. So this is S bar. Event one, one time and one location. Event two at a different time, but the same location. What does Mo see? What does he observe? So Mo is an S and let's think about what the interval that Mo observes between the two events. So what is T2 minus T1 according? Um, so this is the time interval according to Mo between the two events. So here we have the Lorentz transformation from the unbarred coordinates to the barred, but we can write down the inverse which is just that t is um, gamma t bar plus ux over c squared. Okay, so we saw this before. So we can write t2 minus t1 using the inverse transformation. This equals gamma and it equals um, t2 bar plus ux over c squared minus t1, which is just uh, gamma times t1 bar plus u, and it's the same x, x bar, sorry, over c squared. Okay, so the locations are the same, so these terms cancel, there's a minus sign here. So we find that Mo in S, his interval T2 minus T1 equals gamma times T2 bar minus T1 bar. Okay, and let's let T2 bar minus T1 bar equal delta tau. Then we find that according to Mo, T2 minus T1 is gamma delta tau, or delta t is gamma delta tau, okay? And this is the time interval seen by Mo in S, and this is the time interval in S bar, according to Joe. So this is a profound result, and let's just rearrange it to see uh, it more clearly. So we have that delta tau, this thing, okay, which is the time interval according to Joe, equals delta t, the time interval according to Mo over gamma. Okay, and if you remember, gamma is 1 over the square root of 1 minus beta squared, where beta is u over c. Um, so beta is always greater than 0, so gamma is, is always greater than 1. So therefore we find that delta tau is less than delta t, okay, and it's less than by this gamma factor. So what does this mean? So remember, delta t is the time interval according to Mo. Okay, so you're Mo. Sit yourself in this frame S. The time interval between two events is delta t. In some frame that moves relative to your inertial frame, the time interval is delta tau, and it's not equal to delta t, it's delta t over gamma. So it's less than this. So let's think about this frame that's moving away from you, setting an S, as a clock 
moving with uniform velocity. Okay, so you're setting an S as, as Mo, and there's a clock that's moving with uniform velocity, and that defines the frame S bar. Okay, so the clock moves with uniform velocity, and according to Joe, who's sitting on the clock, the two events, this thing and this thing, they happen in the same place because you're sitting on the clock, but at different times, they're different ticks of the clock. So the ticks of the clock for Joe, who's sitting on the clock, is this delta tau. And Joe's ticks of his clock, we're saying, are smaller than the ticks on the clock, according to Mo, who sees the clock moving. Okay, so this tells us that time dilates, and in particular that moving clocks run slowly. Okay, and this is not just uh, some peculiar effect on a mechanism of a clock, it's actually time that slows. Okay, and let me rub off the board and we'll look at um, a simple thought experiment to see, um, to see in the context of special relativity why this is true and why time itself has to slow down. So we find the result that delta tau, that's the time interval on the clock that's moving, is equal to delta t, that's the time interval as observed by someone in frame s watching the clock move, divided by gamma. Okay, so this is a very important result. Okay, it's, it's time dilation, that moving clocks run slowly. So let's think about a clock Let's think about a special type of clock. It's a clock. So the clock we'll think about is based on two mirrors. And we measure time by the time that light takes to travel between these two mirrors. Okay, so this is one second, two seconds, three seconds. Okay, so if you're in the frame of the clock, then the time interval is this delta tau. Now, let me dim the lights and show you what happens when we move this clock. Okay, so we've got a clock that ticks when the light moves from one mirror to the next, and back and back and so on. So I am in the clock frame and I just see the light moving up and down. You are in a different frame and you're stationary and I'm going to start moving relative to your frame. So in my frame, the clock is the same. The light is just moving up and down vertically. But in your frame, in which you see us moving, the clock moving, the light is tracing out some zigzag path. Okay, so let me turn the lights on and we talk about this a bit more. So to me, I see this, uh, the light just moving between the mirrors, but to you, you see the clock moving, so this is the mirrors at some later times as the clock has been moved. And in my frame I see the light go from one mirror and return. Okay, and the laws of physics are the same in all inertial reference frames. So the light must return to the mirror in your frame also. So you see the light do something like this. Um, take this zigzag path. Okay. So in your frame, the time that passes, delta t, is equal to gamma times delta tau. 
Okay, and remember gamma is greater than one. So the time interval that you observe is larger and it can be much larger than the time interval that I observe. So that means if I take this clock on a spaceship and I travel fast such that gamma becomes much greater than one, then time will move in such a way that a second to me is much slower than a second to you. Okay, according to this formula. Okay, so the time interval for you will be much larger than the time interval for me. So one year traveling on the spaceship for me may be multiplied by 50 to give 50 years for you. So if I travel on a spaceship with this clock for one year, then 50 years may have passed for you. Okay, this is a real effect. It's time itself that is slowing down. And it means that you can um, technically travel into the future if you can travel fast enough. Okay, traveling backwards in time is a different matter and requires you to travel faster than the speed of light. Okay, we've seen that if you can do that, that breaks causality and you get into the strange paradoxes. Um, like what happens if you can go back in time and kill your grandfather, etc. Okay, so we don't have to worry about that, but traveling into the future is technically possible. And it's true and it happens. And we'll see an example um, where it happens. But why do we not see this usually? Why do we not experience this? Um, we don't experience it because the gammas that we encounter in our everyday world are so small that the time dilation is uh, minuscule and we just don't notice it. Okay, but there have been experiments where they've send, sent atomic clocks into aircraft for years and years and years um, to verify and, and measure these things. So you may say, okay, this clock is a special clock that um, relies on light rays moving between two mirrors. But let's think about another type of clock, maybe one with wheels and gears, maybe a pendulum, or maybe one that relies on radioactive decay or the time a cell takes to divide, etc. So if we think about this light clock and maybe the one with wheels and gears, if before we get on the spaceship we synchronize them and decide that there's nothing funny about these clocks and they behave as expected, then once we bring them on to the spaceship, as we're moving, on the spaceship, we're in an, another inertial reference frame. And if the clocks, this light clock and the one with wheels and gears start to deviate from each other, then the mismatch in the clocks will tell us or will allow us to infer that we are moving and the speed at which we are moving. Okay, but this is impossible because we are in an, an inertial reference frame. Okay, so we can't tell that we are moving if we are in an inertial reference frame. Okay, and this goes back to sitting in the under deck of Galileo's ship, watching the butterflies flutter away and the, the drops drop into the vessel. If we are in an inertial reference frame, then the two clocks must stay synchronized. Otherwise, we could infer that we are moving and this is impossible. So if the light clock slows down, then the, the clock with the wheels and gears, the pendulum, must also slow down. And the one that base, is based on the time it takes a cell to divide must also slow down. So regardless of the machinery of the clock, it will slow down. Um, so what does this mean? If all clocks slow down, then we're forced to conclude that time itself slows down. Okay, so that's a a grand statement. Time itself slowing down means if you're on this spaceship traveling fast away from Earth, then everything, every process, so your, your heartbeat, your pulse rate, your thought process, 
how long it takes your cells to divide and multiply, how long it takes you to um, grow up and get old, they all slow down in the same proportion. Time itself has slowed down, all because of the requirement that we can't tell if we're moving uh, in an inertial reference frame. Okay, so this is one of the profound consequences of the postulates of special relativity and of the Lorentz transformations that um, emerge from them. And this is an experimentally verified fact of our universe. Okay, so time is subjective. There is no absolute time and time slows down if you have a moving clock. So as we've just seen, time is not absolute in special relativity. However, it has not lost all meaning because if you think about it, two identical clocks observed under identical conditions should behave identically. Okay, and this leads to the concept of proper time. And an example of a proper time was the delta tau that we saw in the time dilation um, video in which we considered a clock moving and the delta tau was the time intervals taken sitting in the frame of the clock that was moving. Okay, so if we remember, we said that in special relativity we have this special invariant quantity, ds squared, which is equal to um, minus c squared dt squared plus dx squared plus dy squared plus dz squared. Okay, so this is an invariant quantity. The value of this as measured in one frame will be equivalent to the value measured in all the other frames. So let's define a quantity. So this is an invariant. Let's define a new quantity called delta tau. And this is the invariant time. And this is given by ds and let's put a minus in front and let's divide by c squared. So ds is an invariant, c is invariant, it's the same in all reference frames, so thus ds over c squared is also an invariant. So this d tau is an invariant also. So this ds squared, sorry, over c squared, let's call this d tau squared, this equals so we've got a minus now, so this is d t squared minus 1 over c squared uh, dx squared plus dy squared plus dz squared. Okay, so for a clock that is at rest, so that means if you sit on a clock, then the time passes by, but the dx, dy, and dz are zero, okay? So for a clock at rest, uh, this is equal to zero, and we find that our invariant time, d tau squared, is equal to d t squared. Okay, so that our proper time is the time interval that passes for an observer who sits on the clock. Okay, so if that clock is moving, the person sitting on the clock doesn't know. Okay, so you sit on the clock and the time ticks, but you don't change your position. Okay, so this motivates our proper time. So let's put a box around this. Okay, so this motivates our proper time. For a clock at rest, the time interval dt equals this invariant quantity d tau. So let's now think about the, the case in which um, there is motion and our coordinates x, y, and z depend on time. Okay, so if we have coordinates x, that depends on time, y that depends on time, and z that depends on time, 
then this quantity ds squared over c squared with a minus can be written as we've got the dt squared and then we have 1 over c squared and the dx squared we can write as dx by dt all squared and we have a dy by dt all squared and we have a dz by dt all squared and then we have a dt squared okay now dx by dt squared is just the x component of the velocity vx squared plus vy squared plus vz squared so this is just equal to dt squared 1 okay for this guy and then this term here has a dt squared so we've got a minus 1 over c squared and the thing here is v so this is v squared over c squared v squared this is okay so we have that d tau squared is this thing so we have that uh, the square root d tau is equal to dt square root of 1 minus v squared over c squared and let me put that in a box okay and this equals dt and you recognize this thing as gamma it's 1 minus beta squared okay so this is our invariant time or proper time it's given by the time uh, from the frame in which we're watching the motion divided by the gamma factor and this gamma factor depends on the velocity v which also depends on t Yes, okay, so just to keep on one board, let me bring this over here. So the proper time increment accumulated by a particle moving with some instantaneous velocity v through time is the integral of this. So it's integral d tau, which is the integral of dt over gamma v. Okay, and this gamma v depends on time also okay because v is the instantaneous velocity okay so this proper time will be useful and it will help us explain um, some phenomena where time dilation is present so now we come to something intimately related to time dilation and that's uh, length contraction. So let's think about two frames. Um, so we have frame S and a different inertial reference frame S bar that moves away from S along the x direction with some velocity u. And we're going to think about a rod or a stick of length L bar that is in S bar. Okay, so the, the end points of this rod are at x1 bar here and x2 bar, which equals x1 bar plus L bar. Okay, so the question is, what length does an observer in frame S observe the rod to be? Can we simply go to our Lorentz transformations and we think so we have for x bar so we have x1 bar equals gamma x1 minus ut1 and x2 bar is gamma x2 minus ut2 okay where these x and t's are the coordinates as observed by someone in frame S.
Now because the free MS bar and the rod are moving away from free MS, then if you're sitting in free MS and you want to measure the length of the rod, then you better make sure you measure both endpoints at the same time. Okay, otherwise the rod will have moved. So we need that T1 and T2 uh, must be the same. So if we set T1 and T2 to be equivalent, then we find the length of the rod, x2 bar, so this is L bar, is x2 bar minus x1 bar. That's the length of the rod according to the observer in S bar. Equals gamma, and then we have x1 minus x2, sorry, x2 minus x1, of course. Okay, so this is gamma times the length of the rod L according to an observer in S. So we find that the length of the rod as observed by someone in S is the length of the rod observed by someone in S bar, L bar. You can think of this as the proper length of the rod. So the length of the rod measured by someone sitting in the frame of the rod divided by gamma. So L equals L bar divided by gamma. And remember what gamma is, gamma equals one over the square root, one minus u squared over c squared, which is greater than or equal to one. Okay, and it's only equal to one if you use zero. That's when the two frames are the same frame. So if the rod is moving away from you, so if you're sitting in it in frame S and the rod moves away, then you observe the rod to be shorter than someone moving with the rod. Okay, so this is length contraction. And uh, it leads to the conclusion that there are no rigid bodies in special relativity. Okay, a rigid body is um, a body with fixed lengths in it. Okay, um, and it gives us some puzzling consequences and questions. And a famous one is the train in the tunnel paradox, where you have a train, here's a train, okay, and it enters a tunnel, and the train is of length L, and the tunnel is of length L. And the question is, will this train fit in the tunnel? Okay, if the train is moving with some velocity, V. Okay, so in special relativity, if you're sitting on the train, you see the tunnel approaching you with some velocity, U. And we've just said that if you are measuring something that's moving, you see it as contracted by this factor, gamma. So if you're sitting on the train, this is you sitting on the train, then from your point of view, this tunnel is not of length L, it's L divided by gamma. And you will say, ah, well my train is of length L, so we will not fit in this tunnel. If you're sitting in the tunnel, in the tunnel frame, you see the train moving towards you with velocity v. So you conclude that the train length must be L divided by gamma. So actually the train is shorter than the tunnel, so it will fit. So this is a famous paradox, and really it's a non-paradox because it's not really a paradox because the reasoning we've just used there is flawed. Okay, um, and it's all to do with simultaneity of events and the time that the train enters the front and back of the tunnel, etc. Okay, and maybe we'll discuss this in one of our live uh, classes. Okay, it's an interesting non-paradox. Okay, because actually there's one answer, one explanation, one reality of what happens, whether the train fits in the tunnel or not. Okay but it just takes some careful thought to understand it. Okay, so length contraction and time dilation are intimately related. 
and we're going to show an example now. We're going to work through an example showing that uh, one or the other kind of just depends on the perspective of the observer. Okay, so now let's look at an example um, that considers both time dilation and length. Con con <laughs> bah. So now we're going to think about an example um, that considers both time dilation and length contraction. We're going to think about uh, cosmic rays that bombard Earth. Okay, so this is Earth. And all the time Earth's being bombarded with cosmic rays, which are just particles like protons or alpha particles. And these cosmic rays interact with the molecules in the atmosphere. And when they do so, other particles can be created. Um, one particular one is a muon. Muon, with the symbol little mu. And a muon is just a heavy electron. Okay, it's 300 times heavier than an electron roughly, but with the same charge. And a muon is a, an unstable particle, so it will decay itself into other particles. And the time, the lifetime for decay is about a microsecond, so 10 to the minus 6 seconds. This is the decay time of the muon. Okay. Now the muon travels at um, velocities close, at speeds close to the speed of light. And our non-relativistic theory would tell us that the muons could only travel maybe one kilometer. However, we know from observations that muons can be created here at this distance, and let's call this distance 10 kilometers, and be observed hitting the surface of the Earth. Okay, so how can we explain this? They should only travel one kilometer, but we see them traveling 10 kilometers. So from the time dilation point of view, this is simple. We know from time dilation that the lifetime of the muon, according to someone on Earth that's seen the muon move, the decay time for someone on Earth is equal to gamma times the decay time from the muon's frame. Okay, so the muon here is our moving clock, and we know that moving clocks run slowly um, from the viewpoint of someone in the stationary frame, which is in this case Earth. Okay, so if it goes 10 kilometers and it should only go one kilometer, then this means the gamma is about 10. Okay. Um, okay, so time dilation explains it from the point of view of someone on Earth. But what does the muon see? Okay, imagine you are the muon, or you're traveling with the muon. You know from your internal clock that you will live for 10 to the minus six seconds. Okay, and you know how fast the earth is approaching you. So how can you explain the fact that you can travel further than a non-relativistic theory would tell you? So from the muon's perspective, we can explain this through length contraction. Okay, so if you remember previously, we said that if we have a rod of length L bar that is moving with respect to an observer in a different frame S, the person in that stationary frame S measures the rod not to be L bar, but to be L bar over gamma. Okay, so here in this case, the L bar is the length of the rod in the moving frame. Okay, so if we're the muon, we see the Earth approach us with some high velocity. And uh, we can think of this distance as being a rod in the moving frame. So this is our L bar. Okay, so 
the distance, the muon sees, the stationary frame. So we're traveling with the muon, so we're in this stationary frame effectively. And we see the earth and the rod move towards us. So from the muon's perspective, this distance L bar is divided by gamma. And this is the distance to the earth from the muon that the muon sees. So from the muon's perspective, the earth looks flattened like a pancake and the whole universe is squashed. So the earth looks something like this. And this 10 kilometers to the muon only looks like one kilometer. From the muon's perspective. Okay, so although the muon will only live for a microsecond, it only has to travel a tenth of the distance compared with the earth frame where the distance is 10 kilometers and the time is dilated by a factor of 10. Okay, so from this example, you can see that time dilation and length contraction are both intimately related, but they um, just depend on the observer, okay? Um, so in one sense, we're using time dilation to describe the phenomena, and in the other, we're using length contraction. So I hope you'll agree that time dilation and length contraction are wildly non-intuitive concepts, but they are reality. They are the reality of the space-time that we inhabit, and uh, this process actually happens, and it's special relativity that tells us why.